Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, time is now just gone 10.30. Um, it's Father's Day, uh, the 16th of June 2013. We're in Southampton, Hampshire, UK, at the house of Mr. Kerwin Rogers, a very influential member and a pioneer of Southampton's Afro-Caribbean community. And he's very kindly allowed us into his home today to talk about his contribution and the, the musical history of Southampton's small but very significant Afro-Caribbean uh, community. So, uh, Mr. Kerwin Rogers, uh, if you'd like to just, uh, well, I've introduced you, uh, just tell us a little bit about your role in the community and the positions you held. Okay, um, well, firstly, I've been a DJ for God knows how long, from back in the 60s, 1967, I started on the 22nd of May. And um, up to the present time, I'm still a DJ and uh, as you quite rightly said, um, I was a veteran in the business from back in those days and you know there's lots of um, different musical you know, generations that come right up to the present day. Uh, I was at the Southampton West Indian Club for 15 years on a Friday and Saturday as a resident DJ until that was taken over. Um, from time to time I still appear there. You know, especially when Maca Foundation's playing there, or, you know, go along with TC and we'd all link up. And with all the um, veteran DJs that have been in Southampton Music on Fraternity, I'm the only one remaining that's still DJing today, you know, and I suppose I shall be DJing until I die, I don't know, you know. He'll be dragging me off the stage and body back because the music is just in my blood. And in a way as well, I could see the different influences of all the younger generations like um, Briggy from Macca Foundation, my brother Terry and TC and Wayne Salmon. TC and Wayne Salmon actually has now relinked with me and come out and doing all the DJ work as well. You know, also as well, I've um, been involved in presenting radio um, at Unity 101 and before that I um, was on a radio station in Northern, you know, so I, I've been around in the music business and I, 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 you know, I mean, I've known and seen a lot of good artists and, you know. Right, so, um, Cohen, let's start at the beginning. Can I ask you when you first came to Southampton, what year and from which island? Okay, um, I came here again in, I think, just roughly in the summer in May 1966, a year before I got involved in music. <clears throat> and um, originally I came to my uncle in High Wycombe so that he could, you know, pick me up from the airport because my parents didn't drive and I spent a week there, then came down to Southampton. And, uh, you know, once I was in Southampton, uh, I started to get to know a few of the, you know, Caribbean people, you know, from various countries and so on. And uh, it just went from there, really, just, you know, meeting people and picking up vibes from them. But the majority of people that was in Southampton at the time, black people rather, or Caribbean people, was on um, Jamaicans. And people thought I was Jamaican because I spoke like with a Jamaican twang, you know, I always try to hold on to my mother town, my Caribbean town. But yes, as you say, uh, I came from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and uh, a lot of people don't know where that is, but St. Vincent and the Grenadines is 90 nautical miles from Barbados, and the most famous island that St. Vincent governed, which is a chain of 32 islands, St. Vincent being the mainland, is Mustique of Princess Margaret fame. Now they're called Mustique, um, Millionaires Row because all the film stars and big artists and so on, they've all got their properties over there. Right, right. So um, you came over in 1966. Mm -hmm. um, in those days, just tell us a bit about where the Caribbean community was focused, which area? Um, oh, well, that's quite easy. Um, it was Derby Road. Um, Buller Street, Graham Road, and Northumberland Road, mm -hmm. and it was all 
in those days we call it house party and then later on I call it blues and then the legal name for it was Shibin. That was from the law's point of view. But um, the people that influence the music and primarily Jamaican music um, was people like um, Gloria in um, Buller Street, um, Glennis Brown, Beresford Slater, uh, my father-in-law, Robin Vernon, but his son was called Robin S. And there were people like, um, well, I don't even know his proper name, but I was just a young plumber. Um, you know, he lived in Denzel Avenue, lives in Denzel Avenue still, sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was, oh, Craig, you can remember the, the name of the other songs. But all I remember, there was people like Wilfred, you know, around those songs. Um, Boots. Uh, so these, these uh, Celine Gillens. Um, yeah. He had a song which I fronted called King G Sounds. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was more the educational side of stuff. So he just got me involved in the music. So really, I was the first younger generation to people like Yank and Boots and so on as a King G Sounds. But King G Sounds um was only for a short period of time because you know Salim really wanted to concentrate mainly on the political and educational side of things so that's why I did that and also he opened a record shop which I managed for him and 6 8 on Solo Road right, right. and uh, the only other record shop prior to that that was really something as was Henry's Records mm. in St Mary's Street and that's where I used to buy all my Jamaican 7 inch imports and then when Salim said to me look I want to open a record shop um, and I want you to manage it for me you say solely you you be the manager you go to London to all the different places like you know uh, Palmer songs long before Jetstar because um Palmer evolved into Jetstar yeah. you know Island Records on the Chris Blackwell and so on so uh, you know what I mean I went all over London Leeds mm. then Halls then you name it and that's the places I went to get all the specialist you know records right. So, I mean, all these people you've mentioned and the roads you've mentioned, these are people who held what we call blues parties or shabins. Yes. Now, what, what was it about the mainstream um, culture and the, or the lack of, um, obviously, provisions for Caribbean people in the mainstream culture that led to members of the Afro-Caribbean community creating their own little mini nightclubs or mini shabins, mini blues? When you were young, you know, uh, Afro Caribbean man in Southampton, could you hear the music you want? Where could you hear them in the mainstream? Where could you hear your music? Um, when you went to nightclubs, what was the reception black people got in those days? What were what were the circumstances, uh, or the lack of provision for the Afro Caribbean community that led them to start their own blues and shabins? Well, that's quite easy to answer. Um, there was no nightclubs really or any entertainment centre that really catered for the Caribbean people. I mean, the Royal Pair under Johnny Diamond, uh, that's where I first started going to as a teenager. And Johnny Diamond would play maybe four or five um, Caribbean you know, tracks during the night, but primarily he would play a lot of um, Tamla Motown, Atlantic and Stack Souls, so, because, you know, growing up on that music, I frequented that place and then Adam and Eve, which was behind the old Echo offices in High Street in Southampton. Um, for some reason they put on the Pioneers and we went there but they wouldn't let us in. There was about 10 of us guys and they wouldn't let us in. There was people like Ruben, Boy Blue, you know, which were my good friends. You know, Ruben is from St. Vincent, Boy Blue was from Jamaica, he died. Mm. Um, in London somewhere and uh, when we went they wouldn't let us in and we thought it was quite strange because I think well the Pioneers is a black reggae group you know established in London and you know the doorman wouldn't let us in so and never mind what we said to them they wouldn't let us in and then the next time was Desmond Decker and the Aces still wouldn't let us in so it goes on I think maybe the older generation from us already knew that we are the younger generation coming up hadn't realized that they wouldn't let us in because I think if the you know if you know the English society as as it was then 
saw like two or three black guys together, they expect trouble. Right. And right. you know, like when I started go hanging out with my white mates, I said to them, why do we think that black guys going to give them trouble? I say, you know, most black guys I know are extroverts. And when we dress up nice and we go out to party, we want to pull the girls, we want to show off our dancing skills, we don't want to fight. I mean, if there's a fight, yes, we'd accommodate it, but we don't actually go and looking for fights. So, you know, why does the white establishment think that, you know, we come up mm. for trouble? Mm. So in those days, obviously, there was a colour bar in some places. Yes. So you couldn't get into nightclubs. Uh, was it the same with pubs? Was there like yeah, a reception? some pubs, you could go into the public bar, but they wouldn't let you in to the saloon and stuff, stuff mm. like that. And, I mean, lots of times I have incidents like where there wasn't a lot of black guys around at my time, as I said. So most of my friends were white. And of course, um, sometimes we'd go somewhere and then my friends would start fighting and then I didn't realize it was something to do with me until later on I said, oh, they wouldn't let you in or, you know, you've got to pay more for the drinks. And of course, we started looking at, you know, all the various pubs and bars that we went to and the things that we find, like, if one of my white friends bought, like, say, three pints of lager and in those days it was quite cheap and said that was about a pound, you know, just, just you know, off the top of my head. If I was to go and buy the same lager, it cost me one pound fifty. Right. So, you see, so um, it, it's the little things like that that make you start thinking about it. And I think the generation like Gloria and my father in law and Barry Sussley and so on, I think they knew that. And of course, rather than go out and be humiliated, they started playing music indoors. In these houses. And then they start, you know, people start saying, oh, Gloria's having a party tonight and so on. So we'd go around there. You know, and then Berries would have one the next night. But before long, everybody was having house parties. Right, you right. Know, and, you know, basically when you went to house parties, I don't know if I should be saying this, but when you went to house parties, you had to buy your curry goat or your curry chicken and you had to buy your drinks as well. So I think it might have started off like where people like Gloria and my father and Lauren and so on and Glennis Brown and uh, Aesthetics and so on. Lee, but I think and uh, Marie and uh, oh, I forgot one of the music shapers of, of my mind. Um, Joe Powell, he was right opposite the South Ends Hospital, and uh, I've always wondered how Joe every night, and this is not just Friday and Saturday when people stop working, every night Joe had house parties, and at that time the South Hands had the A and E right opposite Joe's house. But I remember this music was blasted out all night long and but yet there was never any complaints from the hospital. <laughs> so I don't know how Joe got up, got away with that. So there wasn't much black music played in the radio, in the media or anything like that. You couldn't hear it. Was that right? No. Uh it's when a song hit in the charts that's when you would hear it, but you would not hear it being played until it became popular, mm. so to speak. So like, for instance, um, the people that we used to hear a lot of would have been Desmond Decker, apart from the R&B artists and the Tamla Motang artists, mm. it would have been people like, um, <clears throat> as I say, Desmond Decker and the Aces. I remember um, hearing the Pioneers um, being played a few times too. but. Really, in between, um, mm. radio, the radio wasn't friendly to Caribbean music. Maybe they didn't understand it, or mm. I don't know. It, it's not like you hear today, like guys like Sean Paul or Beanie Man, or you know, they be playing, or, mm. uh, you know. So, so th obviously, this reception you got in nightclubs, in pubs, and the lack of you know black music in the media led to members of the Afro Caribbean community uh, to start their own house parties, their own blues, which are like unofficial nightclubs. You could buy a drink, you could buy food, yes. but more importantly, not feel vulnerable because you were majority of the people were obviously of your own background yes, yes. in a, an environment which you felt comfortable and an environment where the music was the music you wanted to hear. Oh, yes. So what was the setup in these house parties? So it was a house or a basement? Well uh, some of them were like houses like um, my father and mother and was a house you know the lower floor. Uh, 
Gloria again was a lower floor. Um, Lieber was a basement. Uh, Glennis Brown, when he was at Northumberland, was, was a basement. But when he moved to um, Derby Road, it was the ground floor in the house. So, you know, people just improvise really when they had their parties. I remember my mother in law, because um, she had just decorated um, the kitchen downstairs and she didn't want people, tra you know, trapezing through that. So, I remember the front room overlooking the, you know, Derby Road was a room for the party. Got my mm -hmm. father and I string up all the boxes upstairs. And mm -hmm. the reason I remember that, you know, the boxes in those days were massive, you know, um, taller than me, you know, about, I'll say about four foot wide as right. well. So you could imagine the size of those boxes. And where he was a cabinet maker, my father-in-law, he made all his boxes himself. Mm -hmm. And I remember when he first turned up the sun, I could hear the windows rattling. And then, of course, later on in the night, three of the panes fell out and fell downstairs. And there was a guy, I never knew his name, but he's from Jamaica, and they call him police. It was a big, thick set guy. And um, he reminded me of a bigger version of Yellow Man, because he had the same colour as well. You know, police here, yeah. and I remember the glass falling. I think he, I don't know if he was coming in to the house party if he's going up with a glass, sh you know, shards of glass falling out and cutting him. Wow. And I remember on my father, and the, you know, those guys just looked up, never went to the hospital, although the, the Ernie was just up the road. You know, he'd come around the corner from 117, and he's just up the road. And I remember my father, and he was in white rum. I said, no, that's, that would, um, you know, stab the floor and the blood and clean it out. And, you know, <laughs> so I remember little things like that, yeah. you know. So the equipment that was used to play the music in the, the house parties or the blues, what was, what, what was it? Amplifiers, record Right, decks, okay, yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of people mightn't remember this, but um, the, the, the powered amp in those days were called valve amps, you know, and, you know, the, the valves are like bulbs, I mean, they lit up. And most songmen in those days had to make sure they got, you know, spare valves in case it blew. I mean, and the reason for that as well, when there were so many different songs playing, there was rivalry, so some song guys would come and deliberately, I'm not going to call names, <laughs> but they deliberately throw beer onto the amp, because the amp had an open mesh, because, you know, it's not like how an amp is today. It was a big open mesh, like a dome or a square, you know, cover over it, which was, which was um, perforated so that, you know, the, the valves didn't get hot because yeah. they, they used to, you couldn't take a valve out when it was blown unless you put a hanky over it or, you know, something. It would just burn your fingers. Your fingers would stick to it. So, of course, used to come and throw a bed because that van poof for that. So, you know, most young men always carry spares and carry a spare amp as well. You see, um, and the decks in those days, we used to call them wooden garret decks and, uh, Record decks. Yeah, record decks. And um, the other one to rival that was called a Thorison Mark II, you know, deck. So, I mean, I've, I've had quite a few of those back in my days as well. And um, the valve amps, well, the best valve amp that I ever had was one called a Quad 4. I mean, that, that used to do some serious kicking. What sort of power in RMS are we talking about? Oh, I'm talking about, I suppose, for its day about 800 watts of one I had. Wow, wow. You see, so I mean, that used to kick out something, I mean. Yeah. But then, the new versions of those quad amps, when they came out without the valve, would belt out 1500 watts. Wow. So they have the quad four, you know, 1500. Mm. So you had these massive speakers the size of wardrobes. You, so you couldn't amps. get them through that door. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of, and in those days, we're talking about what decades are we talking about now? The 60s. Right, so um, late 60s to the 70s. Mm. And what, were the, what was the type of music played in the blues in those days and what were the famous artists? Right, the music um, was um, ska, rock steady, blue beat. And people like Laura Lakin, uh, Alfonso, Desmond Decker, John Holt. I mean, lots of Studio One music used to come out. There's so many artists that really I can't remember half of their names. But, mm. you know, the, the, the Trojans to me were like people like 
Byron Lee that you know dabbled in Scar the Scatterlights. Mm -hmm. um, Blue Rivers and the Maroon was a ska band from London, from Lewisham. Mm -hmm. That was a wicked. I've actually seen them live in South Hall, and you know, um, and their Blue Beat was the, the thing. Right. You mean so, other bands like the Mohawks and so on, you know? Mm -hmm. You mentioned obviously. Um, Prior to Mr. Salim Gillings opening up his black record shop, mm -hmm. the only record shop that sold uh, any Jamaican music or Caribbean music was Henry's. Yeah. Well, uh, um, the, they, they would sell the stuff that was current, but if you went to Henry, there's a guy there who was very knowledgeable called John. He would order you anything you want, and not just Caribbean music, music from India, music from anywhere in the world. John was very, very knowledgeable. And, um, Henry was um, from Wales and he opened up a record shop really for classical music. He was a classical music man. He never knew anything about the modern and contemporary stuff. So John was a man that was there mm. and he was the backbone really of Henry. Mm. But you know, you go in there and if um, John didn't know the artist, he would, you know, research it and he'd order the music for you. Mm. And within two weeks, I mean, so that's an achievement in two weeks. He he had that music. Right, right. So that's so that, and then Salim Gillings opened up his shop in what year? In, um, 1969. 69. Uh, 6-8 Onsela Road. Right, and how long did that last for? About four years. Um, what really busted him, Salim um, tried to get Little Richard to come here and he would have been successful. Because the Burma Winter Gardens were sold out, um, the tickets, uh, but the bombshell for him was Little Richard does not appear anywhere in the world with a substitute band. And the band wanted the same amount of money that Little Richard wanted for his appearance. And of course, Selim didn't have a backer and he didn't have anybody else. But I had said to him, you know, you got to look for pitfalls when you're in business like that, you know, and you show everything. And yeah, everything was up, ready to go. And then a week before, you know, Richard came over, that bombshell was dropped. You see, because Salim was going, if all the tickets are sold out, we've got enough money to cover the promotion, you know, i.e. through the media, through leafletting and posters around Southampton and the Winter Gardens doing their bit and the Winter Garden was actually sold out. I mean, if you actually went down there and they got, go back in time for those archival records, they should have that. The Winter Garden was sold out. Yeah, yeah. But Salim would have um, been able to pay Richard and to pay for all the advertising and mm. so on. Mm. But he wouldn't have the money for the next band. Right. For the back-end band, sorry. So th th that's why the record shop failed as well because the money that was being pumped into that, well, from, for the advertising of Little Richard came from the shop. So because when the Winter Gardens foreclosed and they wanted their money, the whole thing just collapsed. Right. Okay. And um, obviously another thing I wanted to come back to, Cohen, was you mentioned that obviously there was many venues that allowed um, you know a lot of black music but were there any venues in Southampton that allowed these sound systems that were started in the 60s by the Caribbean uh, community to play were there any halls or places like that where you would have sound system dances in Southampton yes there was two that come to mind is on St Luke's Hall and St Matthew's Hall what what we call the boys club back in the day on Graham Road, um, you know, they allowed us there because it's now a community centre. Mm -hmm. So, but even though it was called a boys club, it was a community centre even in my day as well. And uh, I remember seeing Laura Lake in there, you know, that, you know, and Derek Morgan, you know, so, and you know, it's right. And um, just moving back to the, the house parties, now on a typical Friday, Saturday night, which is when a lot of people go out, if you're in the Derby Road area, what people call now the Newtown area or mm. St Mary's, um, how many blues would there be on a Saturday night or okay, a Friday night? So many blues, you know, one didn't really know, you know, where to go, 
God, there was lots and lots of blues or house parties or so more than one or on. two. Right? Yes, I mean, I myself, um, I would spend maybe a half an hour in all of them <laughs> because, you know, I always wanted to check out their musical influence and, you know, lots of these places gave me that musical influence that I needed because primarily I was from St. Vincent and St. Vincent was Calypso's, which now evolved into Soca. You see, but um, growing up, I used to listen to my um, grandparents' record, which was called Mento, and it was a form of calypso, only that it was more rhythmic and more deeper. You mm -hmm. know, uh, then when I came, you know, here in 1966, because although I knew a little of the Jamaican music back home because it was played on the radio. Uh, it's being exposed to the house parties. I think, oh, this is really lovely because you go there and you listen to all this music. And of course, you, the music was so vibrant, you know I mean? If you didn't have a good time, then you were dead. <laughs> and that's the only way I could put it down. I yeah. mean, and every weekend I was there. And when I started DJing, I finished at the Wessington Club at two o'clock. And I'd head straight for either Glorious or if my father-in-law was having one. You know, I go back a long way with Glenny Sprung as well, so I'd always go to him as well. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, where he built his basement in Northumberland Road, I actually put on the roof and did the electrics there for him. Mm -hmm. And a cousin of mine, um, Dennis the Freighter, he's a carpenter, so he did a lot of that work, and plus he, did, he built the steps going down to the Shebeen. Mm -hmm. You know, so me and Glenis go back a long time. Right. But that's when he was married to Sis, before Sis moved back to Jamaica, yeah. because... She was a Christian, and I think the Christian and the music business didn't go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what happened there, yeah. but she moved back to Jamaica. But yeah. you know, Glenn is gone back to Jamaica now. Mm -hmm. And the last time I saw him was last year when we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the independence of Jamaica from Great Britain. Yeah. So we did that at the Maple Leaf. Mm -hmm. And again, the Maple Leaf was packed solid. Yeah. yeah. You know, and. Uh, it reminded me of the days, you know, when I hold my craft at the West Indian Club. Yeah. Because even a, a friend of mine, um, Jackie Sullivan, she's Facebook to say, now this is how you get the community together. She said, you know, <laughs> and put all the pictures and how the, you know, the Maple Leaf was yeah. really jammed for that session. Yeah. So when you, go, when you would go into a house party, how many people would there be in there? Um, and what you mentioned that they usually start around two o'clock. What time would they finish? And any any um, memorable stories about certain uh, house parties? And did you get complaints from the locals? Were the police ever called? Well, um, I wouldn't rightly say the house party started at two. Yeah. The house party started long before that. Um, I'm only saying that after I finished my stint yeah. DJing at two o'clock, then I'd go to these places. But if I wasn't working, I could go into a, a party from about half seven, eight o'clock anyway, because mm -hmm. I mean, there might be a, a lot of people then. People always tend to want to go out later. Yeah. Um, on the point of complaints, there was always complaints. There was always police raids and things like that. Because I remember, as I say, Glenn is from my friend. You know, he'd ask me a few times if I'm not working elsewhere, you know, could I play some music for him? I mean, all he did was, you know, feed me all night and drinks all night for, you know, um, complimentary because I'm working for free. And the police would raid it quite a lot. I remember police raided it one night and took all my seven inches. Going those days were seven inch records and they were white label. Mm -hmm. If they were on white label, you scratched out the artist and the title because you didn't want other people to know because there was a rivalry as well in the music. Yeah. And yeah. people say, Night Rider, that was my DJ name, by the way. I said, Night Rider, where you get that tune from? And because I used to get all my tunes in London at the independent record shops up there. Yeah. By yeah. Jamaicans mainly. Yeah. And of course I learned that it wasn't me being selfish. That was what the Jamaicans um sung men did. Mm. They all, if they have a tune, they don't want people to know about it. They scratch it, scratch it off the label. So if you look at it, you can't see. Mm. And then that evolved into being white label. Yeah, yeah. So um, 
how many people would there be in a typical blues? And was it all black people? What was the no, what was the makeup well, of the people? The majority of people, I would say, would have been white people because they loved the music. And you know, you, you got to bear in mind that um, most of the black guys had white girlfriends, and um, a few black girls had white boyfriends. Mm -hmm. But the majority of people that used to come in used to be students, used to be people really that loved the music and really was interested in our culture. So they all came from different walks of life and you know, mm. so we, we all really intermingled and had a good time, you know. Mm. You know, there were fights, there was personal things between people. None of this gangster. No, 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 stuff. just personal thing, you know, you, if you had an axe to grind and that's what happened in those days. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I remember again, I was down Liebert. Um, Liebert came in long after some of these other people. Mm. I remember being down at Liebert and um, the police raided it with um, Alsatian dogs. And I <laughs> I got a morbid fair of dogs. <laughs> yeah, they raided it. And I remember one of the dogs pinning me up against the wall <laughs> and stuff like that. And just bearing his teeth at me. Mm. And of course, the Normally they just take your name and uh, mm. then you, you know they'd interview you and then they, if they need to see you further then it would be an invite up to see your central police station and mm. take it from there. But most of the times, you know, I would just give a name and address and a number and they never got back to me. So obviously they knew who they were looking for or whatever was going down. Mm -hmm. And how many people would there be in a blues uh, at oh this capacity? God, um, you couldn't really check because I mean it was always full. I mean and on the ground floor in some places you've got three rooms like so they would be full, the passenger would be full and people <laughs> still be outside. Right, so you hundreds basically yeah, in one yeah, house. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Simply because there was nowhere for the people to go, mm. and even the nightclubs of today, although now they start catering, you know, for all nationalities, they still mm. you know, really do not cater for the way Caribbean people wanted it to be catered for. Mm. Really, mm. I suppose in London, where you're from, might be different, mm. Mm. but in Southampton, mm. you know. The black community has always got to try to evolve musically. Yeah. yeah. And lastly, in sixty seconds, uh, Cohen, what is your message? What is what would you like your legacy and your message to be to the future generations? Well, it's to keep the Caribbean culture alive, keep our music alive. Uh, people um, that's coming up now should really go back and look at the veterans and see what they did, look into that history and then perhaps they'd learn something today. The future of our music, you know, would be nondescript really if they don't go back to the history, you know, because as the saying goes, if you don't know your history then you don't know where you're coming from. Okay. And that music, you know, from back in the day is the music that shape our future generations today. People like um, the late Wild Child, like Craig David, you know, um, like Ebony Rockers, like Maca Foundation, mm. you know, all these, you know, people that came after mm. the veterans, mm. most of them mm. dabbled with the veterans as children. Yeah. You see, and any future generation need to know, you know, what the music scene was like in Southampton. Mm -hmm. And to know that Southampton have a lot of talent and a lot of um, culture to offer. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Kevin. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Ashley. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye. You know.